And now we will continue our reading of the book of Hebrews. I hope you've been enjoying it. Abba Father, be with us as we study the words the Apostle gave to the early Messianic congregations in Israel. Have this word to be sweet to our mouth and make us grow. Shem Yeshua Mashiach, Amen. So, we've been reading the letter that was sent by very possibly Paul as an encouragement pep talk to the troubled Israeli messianic community. The community faces persecution from all sides, from their brethren and from the Romans. They face economic hardship. They face social isolation. They face emotional distress. They face discord, disunity, and betrayal. The letter writer wants to lift the community out of the morass of the fatalistic discouragement that threatens to destroy it. He reaches deep into their Jewish soul. He tells them that their present mission is greater than that of their patriarchs and fathers. He tells them that their faith should stand strong, that Abraham and David are watching them, cheering them from the grandstands. He assures them that the prophets of old have desired to see what they see. He's then, he's, he then tells them that Yeshua is greater than the angels, greater than Moshe, and greater than any high priest you can think of. He tells them that therefore, showing that their ship is stirred by such a great captain, they should not fear. He tells them that if they so much honored the words given to them by prophets, by Moshe, or by angels, how much more should they honor the words given to them by Yeshua, the captain of their salvation, the Son of God? Two weeks ago, we talked about David's messianic understanding of the mysterious character of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who came to bless Abraham, as well as to receive tithes from him. Our letter writer then uses this mysterious Melchizedek in order to explain, document, and text proof his strong messianic theology. Last week we saw how our letter writer chided the congregation for not being as savvy of these things and of the Torah as they should be, but hoping that they can understand and move up from the elementary principles of the Torah, he now enters a very important Midrash, using again mysterious Melchizedek. In Hebrews 7, 1, he starts. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, met Abba Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So again, I want, to, I want to remind you that this priest, Melchizedek, this priest of the Most High, came from nowhere. And that since the Levitical priesthood was not even born yet, this priest was not a Levitical priest from the order of Aaron. But he was another type of priest from another order. Hebrews 7 2 And to him, to Melchizedek, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. See, before, even before the Torah and its instructions concerning tithe and offering to be given to priests and to the temple, Abraham tithes, actually, the word. 10% is at the origin of our, of our word tithe. 
he gives his tithe, his 10% of everything he, he earned to Melchizedek. As later, the children of Israel were taught to do, but to the Levitical priesthood that cared for the temple. And then Hebrews 7 2 continues saying, He, Melchizedek, is first by translation of his name, King of Righteousness. Melchizedek, Tzedek, Melchizedek. That's straight Hebrew translation. It means King of Righteousness. And then he's also King of Salem. He's King, he's actual King of a city that was in those days. Of, uh, uh, a city populated by people called the Jebusite and uh, he was a king of that city Salem we recognize as Salam Shalom it's a it's a it means peace so he's a king of Salem meaning he's king of peace so he's got these two titles and that Salem is of course the city that later David will conquer and will be the city of Jerusalem Hebrews 7 3 now hang on uh, hang tightly because this is very typical Jewish Midrash Hebrews 7 3 he is without father or mother or genealogy having neither beginning or days of days nor end of life but resembling the Son of God he continues as a priest forever so here because of this verse many people uh, say and teach that he is an early theophany of Yeshua that he is actually an early apparition of Yeshua maybe they're right maybe they're right but as far as Bible interpretation if there is a pragmatic interpretation that doesn't require the supernatural I think we should always look at it and generally, at least in Jewish types of hermeneutics, that the, the non-supernatural pragmatic interpretation trumps the supernatural one. Usually, not always. So, but is there a non-supernatural interpretation to that verse? He is talking to us about a man who has no mother, no father, no genealogy. And, you know, it's like, whoa, what is that? I'm going to present you something else. And you can take it or leave it. No skin of my nose, as they say. But to make intelligent decisions, we've got to know many sides. Here it is. In, in those days, religion religious leaders such as priests and monarchy kings practiced what would be today called cronyism which means that the title is passed on to family and it was generally to the son as such, kings and priests were always succeeded, succeeded by their relatives. That is why many Bible books start with genealogies. And why also uh, we're often given the names of the fathers. So that's really, that's really important. Genealogy was very, is very important in the Bible. We have, there's plenty of genealogies. Even the book of uh, Ruth ends with a mini genealogy. Because it goes into the genealogy of Messiah, which is very important. Uh, but as far as Melchizedek, all of a sudden he appears and we're not given anything. According to the text, he has no mother, no father. We know nothing about his parental origins, except that though he is a priest, he couldn't be from the order of Aaron. Why? Aaron was not born yet. He was, not even, he was not even a wink in Abraham's eyes. He, Aaron still rested in Abraham's loins. 
waiting to be born a few hundred years later. So Melchizedek could not have been a priest according to the order of Aaron. That's why the father, the, the writer, he writes, he is without father or mother or genealogy. We don't know anything. We don't know when he was born. We don't know why he died. That's why the writer also writes, having neither beginning of days nor of lives. Then, in a typical Jewish Midrashic fashion, he uses, the author uses that lack of information to tell us that he resembles the Son of God. Now, resemble is different than similar. Similar means the same. Resembles means looks like. He said, but resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. Very little indeed is known about him, but what is known is that he is the king of the Jebusite city called Salem, which later became Jerusalem. And as far as we can see, would these five kings that were coming to conquer the towns of the Negev, Sodom and Gomorrah and another town called Zohar, I think, uh, would these five kings have been su successful in destroying and taking over the city of the Negev? Salem would have been the next target. This could explain Melchizedek's visit to Abraham and his Canaanite allies whom Hashem blessed with victory. So, that's an idea. That's an idea. A man who, who did not die, who lived and not die, is common in the Bible. Not, not so common, but some examples are, you know them, Enoch, Elijah. Here's another one. Some people believe that Melchizedek was actually Shem, the son of Noah. If you look at the chronological table, we see that Shem was still alive in the days of Abraham. So there is a possibility. What I like actually about that idea of Melchizedek's identity is that while Moshe gives us in the writings of the Torah, while Moshe gives us pre-flood history, the Garden of Eden, Genesis, basically. He was, he was born 2,000 years, 2,500 years after the flood. You know? That's kind of, no, maybe I'm wrong in my statement, but he, he was born way after the flood, Moshe. He was born way after the flood, maybe 1,000 years of the flood. So he was born a thousand years after the flood, Moshe, but yet he writes the whole book of Genesis like if it was there. Some people say that God told him every word of the Torah from his mouth. Every letter, every word. I don't have any reason to doubt it, but there is another possibility, is that for that book of Genesis, he might have been basing a little bit on, on text that were given to him, and how would they have been given to him? You see, before the flood, people could write. Enoch, who lived before the flood, was a scribe. And so there was writing and everything before the flood. A lot of technology that existed before the flood may have been wiped out. But people could write. Enoch was a scribe. 
So here you are pre-flood, you're Noah and the children, and the whole world's going to be destroyed. Aren't you going to keep some records? Going to say, wow, we've got to keep this, we've got to keep that story. But you maybe, I don't know, me, I would gather everybody that had a piece of the history, and while we build the, the ark at work at night, at night by the campfire, tell us, and we take note. You know, that like, uh, Methuselah still, still lived. The oldest man. Wouldn't you have Methuselah come and say, okay, tell us everything you know. You know, I don't know. It makes sense. Uh, things that Shem would have brought with him from pre-flood era into the post-flood era. And who knows that they were not passed on to Abraham and what one of Abraham's legacy was to pass on these stories and these things, you know, which made their way into Moses' hand. I don't know. You know, it's a possibility. You know, but all we know really about Melchizedek is at the end of the day, no matter how, many, how much we speculate, we really don't know who he is. You know, so it's nice when we don't know, we can speculate, it's fun. You know, as long as we keep our speculation as just that, speculation. So, it's important to do that because all these speculations are not evidence. And evidence is something that you see. A speculation can be circumstantial evidence. You see A plus B, you conclude C, but you really know wasn't there. So circumstantial evidence is should be held on loosely. So here I'll go back to the text. He's Melchizedek is without father, mother or genealogy, neither having beginning having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. Resembling the Son of God. He continues as a priest forever. So here's our writer telling us all these things. According to the text, he's got no mother, no father, no genealogy, no beginning of days, no end of days. So we don't know when he's born and he's still alive. And I think we're having a little bit of problem. You want to see? I think we're having a little bit of problem. So I'm going to... It's still on. It's still on? Yeah. Okay. I don't I know. Ask everybody to say. Yeah, because uh, Can you see? what I'm seeing here is that uh, they're not playing the video. Okay. So um, we're going to take a break. Can go bathroom maybe or something? Seeing it. Okay, can you monitor it then? Yeah, what, it, uh, what are you seeing? Is it black. Black? I see black. It looks fine. Okay. It looks fine. Okay. Our writer will now continue his comparative work. Here is his great proof text argument by which he infer. He infers the great grandioseness of our Master. Hebrews 7 4. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils, and whose descendants of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Again, I'll read it. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Duh. And so we have here a Melchizedek who is not from Aaronic priestly descent, who blesses Abraham and in Abraham blessing the priestly descent. 
So, and he says, the inferior is blessed by the superior. So he says, Melchizedek is superior to Aaron. The priesthood of Melchizedek is superior to the priesthood of Aaron. Seven, eight. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. The Levitical priests are mortal and they receive the price, the, the tithe, though they are mortal. But in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. And that, like Enoch and the prophet Elijah, we do not have any reports of Melchizedek's death. So, again, the writer is using that either lack of information or reality to define who is Yeshua. Hebrews 7, 9. One might even say that Levi himself who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. That's quite a midrash. But our author is not finished. Let's go to another. 711. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the Torah, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? So, what's he saying here? He's asking a question. The question is, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the Torah. It is true that the Levitical priesthood provided some sort of covering and atonement to allow us closer access to Hashem. But then he continues saying, what further need would there have been of another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? Wait a minute. He seems to be putting he says, in English he says, if Aaron was enough, why do we need Melchizedek? Why, why was Melchizedek mentioned afterward? You know? He, but why is he putting Melchizedek after Aaron? If we had Aaron, why do we need Melchizedek again? So, Why is he putting afterward when, when Melchizedek was mentioned before? He should say, why would we need Aaron when we have Melchizedek? But he says, he says why do we need Melchizedek when we have Aaron? 7.2, 7.12. Then he says, for when there is a change of priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the Torah as well. What is he talking about? Okay, first of all, let's go through this. When there is a change of priesthood, there is a change of the Torah. Let's say it's a little bit like our government. Let's say our government is, in America, is really the Torah. Let's say, let's say it's a constitution. But it's run by a different set of priests, politicians. Sometimes it's run by this party and sometimes by that party depending on which party wins. But it's still the same constitution run by a different sort set of people, which do a different uh, administration, we call it. They administer differently to the same constitution. So, so, uh, so that's what he's saying. For when there is a change of priesthood, there is necessarily a change in Torah as well. Verse 13, For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. Who is, who is, the, one who, who is the one who speaks of these things? Yes, Melchizedek. He is continuing on his early references to King David. You see, he is continuing on his earlier references to King David, who is the one prophes who is the one who prophesied about Messiah being a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. You see when he says, For the one 
of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe. You see, that's King David. He's referring to the class we had two weeks ago on, on, on uh, Hebrews 5 and a little bit of 6. Where David says, David who lived, uh, what, maybe 600, 700, 600 years after Moses? David who says, uh, you are a priest who receives this verse, who, who is told by Adonai, you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. You know, so why? But these things are spoken about him, but he says, uh, he says, verse 13, belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the, at the altar. Uh, the Ju David is from the tribe of Judah. David is from the tribe of Judah, which didn't have service at the altar of Aaron. Judah was not part of the priesthood. The tribe of Aaron is Levi. Those were the priests. So why does David receive these words? You're a priest. I've spoken the word you're a priest according to the other of Melchizedek. Well, if we read the story of David, you know, uh, we read in the text of 2 Samuel, he brings the ark to Jerusalem. He established a tabernacle called, until this day, the tabernacle of David, which Amos, the prophet, talks about in Amos 9, and which James uses in Acts 15. So David was from the tribe of Judah. He brings the ark to Jerusalem, establishes the tabernacle of worship with music and praise. And we're told that as he brought the ark to Jerusalem, he made offerings. What? People from Judah do not make offerings. It's the people from Levi who do it. But he had been told he's a priest under another order. So technically he doesn't have the right to do that, but Hashem told, me, told him that he was a priest, but not a priest according to the order of Aaron, but a, a different priest, one from the order of Melchizedek. The very Melchizedek to whom Abraham, the ascent of Aaron, gave tithes to. Like our master, really, David was king, priest, and prophet. The three ministries that require anointing with oil. oil. So, in 1 Samuel 7, that we read before, King David is given the promise that his own descendant will be the Messiah. I know it's a bit complicated. Maybe you can listen to this and read it again. You know, But the person who's writing these words, he, he really knows his text. So I'll read again from 7.13. For the one of whom these things are spoken, David, are spoke, uh, belong to another tribe from which no one has ever ser served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from, descend from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. Like we said, Judah doesn't have a priesthood role. 715. This, what we just talked about, becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an industrial, industri indestructible life. In other words, he is not a priest. He is a priest not because it's written in the Torah that, like all descendants of Aaron, will be priests are eligible to be priests whether they like it or not. But this Melchizedek was a priest just because of a common command by God. One doesn't negate the other, but the latter, the latter is superior to the former. And then 717, for it is witnessed of him, you are a priest according to the old O Melchizedek. That's a proof text about David, the ancestor of Messiah, 
the man who was told that his descendant will be the Messiah in Second Samuel 7. And then he says, 7.18, For on the, one, on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the, law made, the Torah made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Wait a minute, did I hear this right? Is he saying that the Torah is weak and useless? Is he saying that? Actually, he did. And this is something that people often use to say that the Torah is not needed. So I'm going to explain to you what this means with a little skit. But I'm having a problem because I don't see my screen. So I don't see what you can see. So I'm going to need um, Chris, Mrs. Lombroso to let me know if you see everything. Okay. Do you see my box? Do you see the box? Uh, yes, it's today, okay. so. I have this thing here. Yeah. Okay. And it's got, if you can see, it's got Philip's head. I want to, I want to put it in, I, I want to put it in something. Let's say it's a square now. I want to put it in this piece of wood. Yeah, you can see it this time. Okay, I, in this piece of wood. Okay, so Philip's head. So I need a tool. I can't do it in my hand. It doesn't work. I need a tool. So I'm going to look for tools. Here. Oh, let's say I have a tool here. Now you tell me, the children, you can tell me. Is that a good tool I can use for this? You know, maybe I can do this with it. Can doesn't work very well. I'll say, this is useless. I mean, it's useless for the job I want to do. Let, let's see, I'll choose another one. Maybe this one. Maybe I can turn it like this, maybe. Yeah. Uh, oh. Doesn't work. Maybe I can bang it. Well, I just hurt my fingers. You know, so. This is useless and weak. Well, for that job. Maybe I'll try this one. Maybe I'll go this way, I'll make it small, you know, and, yeah. Uh, useless and weak. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll do this one, I'll do this one. You know, okay. Oh, my finger, you know, it, but it's still not the best. It, useless and weak. Then maybe I'll try this one. Aha, ha. now I've got the right tool to do the job. You say, you see? This useless and weak. This is the right tool. And the whole idea it's, it's the wrong tool for the job. So so here he says uh, 718 for on the one hand a former commandment is set aside because of his weakness and uselessness for the Torah was made nothing perfect. Duh! The Torah was never made to make anything perfect. So it's, it's, it's weak and useless to help us attain to perfection. That was never the goal for it. Jews have always known that the Levitical priesthood's intention was not to make us perfect. Actually, the Torah makes us aware of our imperfection. Paul taught that. The role of the Levitical priesthood is to cleanse us so we are semi-presentable before God. It doesn't even delete our sin. It just buys them with the blood of an animal. The weakness and uselessness of the Levitical priesthood is that it cannot make us perfect. Like the priesthood of Melchizedek can. Because that's its job. Again, our writer shows us why the priesthood of Yeshua is greater than the priesthood of Melchizedek. No, of Aaron. 7.18, we continue with our text. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the Torah made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So again, you see, this is a whole thing of the letter to the Hebrews. 
we had this. But now we have that. It's greater. Come on, you guys. So, and he continues on with more proof text of the grandiose grandeur of the priesthood of Yeshua as compared to the priesthood of Levi. 720. And it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests were made such such without an oath. There was already an oath, a thing in the Torah, all the sons of Aaron. So it's, it's a done deal without even making a new oath. But 721 says, But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn I will not and he, and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. You know, so that's a... Uh, it's a more uh, uh, permanent oath, and that was found in Psalm 110.4, Seven, Hebrews 7.22. This makes Yeshua, our author says, this makes Yeshua the guarantor of a better covenant, the guarantor of a better oath. The former priests were many in numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. They were mortal. But he, ho but he, Yeshua, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Wow. And then the author comes to his most important point. A point that we should never forget. You know, like the, the, the priests that would die and the priest had a certain clout. For example, a man who was in the city of refuge, he, was, he could go free once a high priest dies. You know, so it's very... Uh, uh, the high priest has a, has a very big role that people count upon, but here this man who has this very important role dies because he's a mortal. Yeshua doesn't. He says, he says, this is the big point here, 725, consequently, consequently, remember, he's talking to a congregation that's in disarray, that's, that, again, like I said in the beginning, financial trouble, social isolation, uh, he's talking to a congregation who, who faces persecution, emotional, psychological distress. And his form of encouragement is to tell them, look up, don't look down. Look at the captain of your salvation, look at the Son of God, he who is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. That's the action he requires us to do at this very time. That's what he wants us to do. To look up to him, to look to the captain of our salvation, to look to him who is able to save us to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives, doesn't die. Did that once? Resurrected. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't that beautiful? In those type of events, that's what we're supposed to do. Look up, not lose faith. Verse 26, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins, and, they, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all, when he offered up himself. For the Torah appoints man in their weakness as high priest, but the word of the oath, which came later, Psalms 110.4, later than the Torah, appoints a son, S-O-N, who has been made perfect forever. Isn't that awesome? I think it is awesome. So let's, let's uh, glorify that awesomeness with songs.